The 30th of January, 1933. Adolf Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany, bringing an end to German democracy. Guided by racist and authoritarian ideas, the Nazis abolish basic freedoms and seek to create a community which would unite all social classes and regions of Germany behind one Führer. The Third Reich quickly becomes a police state where individuals are subject to arbitrary arrest and imprisonment. The Nazis effectively use propaganda to win the support of millions of Germans to facilitate persecution, war, and ultimately genocide. There is, however, some German opposition to the Nazi state, but critics of the Nazi regime would often pay the ultimate price for their defiance of the Führer. One of them is Alexander Schmorell. Alexander Schmorell was born on the 16th of September 1917 in Orenburg, then the Russian Empire. His paternal grandfather was a Prussian trader, Karl August Schmorell, who had lived in the Ural city of Orenburg since 1855. He held positions in the city administration and owned industrial companies such as breweries and factories for surgical materials. Alexander's father, Hugo, was a physician and his mother Natalia was a daughter of a Russian Orthodox priest. She had Alexander baptized in the Russian Orthodox Church, but died of typhus during the Russian Civil War when Alexander was only two years old. In 1920, his widowed father married Elizabeth Hoffmann, a German woman who, like him, was raised in Russia. In 1921, when Alexander was four years old, the family fled from Russia to Munich. The Russian nanny, who moved to Germany with them, took his late mother's place in Alexander's upbringing. Since she hardly spoke German, Alexander Schmorell grew up bilingually, speaking both German and Russian natively. From 1928 to 1937, Schmorell attended gymnasium in Munich, where he had to repeat his second year because of his deficiency in Latin. After he finished gymnasium, Schmorell started with a Reich labor service. This organization helped mitigate the effects of unemployment on the German economy, militarize the workforce, and indoctrinate it with Nazi ideology. It was the official state labor service, divided into separate sections for men and women. From June 1935 onward, men aged between 18 and 25 may have served six months before their military service. In November 1937, Alexander Schmorell voluntarily joined the Wehrmacht, the German armed forces, as a member of the 7th Artillery in Munich. He was trained as a gunner for one year, and then spent half a year in army medical service training. After, in 1939, Schmorell announced his intentions to become a doctor, he was discharged as a non-commissioned officer and began studies in medicine in Hamburg. After studying there for one semester, he returned to Munich to continue his education at the Ludwig Maximilian University. The Second World War began on the 1st of September 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. The German invasion of France, Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands started on the 10th of May 1940 and became known as the Battle of France. These countries along with France, where Schmorell served as a medical non-commissioned officer, were conquered within six weeks. In September 1940, Schmorell returned to Munich to continue his studies. There, in June 1941, he came to know Hans Scholl, whom he met through Christoph Probst, his lifelong friend. In the summer of the next year, he met Willy Graf, another university student. Together, they discussed what Graf had experienced in Serbia and Poland, where he had worked as a medic. In Poland, Willy Graf had also seen the Warsaw Ghetto, which was the largest of all Jewish ghettos in Nazi-occupied Europe during World War II. An average daily food ration in 1941 for Jews in Warsaw was limited to 184 calories, compared to 2,613 calories for the Germans. An official German order stated that the basic provisioning of the Jewish residential district must be less than the minimum necessary for preserving life, regardless of the consequences. The hunger in the ghetto was so great that dying people were laying on the streets and small children were seen begging. Over 80,000 Jews died as a result of the appalling conditions, overcrowding and starvation. On Sunday the 22nd of June 1941 started Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the Soviet Union. The 3,000 personnel of four Einsatzgruppen were sent to the Eastern Front to kill the Jews and Gypsies, as well as Soviet political commissars. Willy Graf was sent to Russia where he saw unspeakable atrocities committed by the Nazi Party's own SS forces and the Wehrmacht. These experiences traumatized him. 
When Graf was relieved of duty temporarily and sent back to the University of Munich to continue his studies in April 1942, he shared these experiences with Alexander Schmorell, as well as Hans Scholl and Christoph Probst. They felt compelled to take action and began the Nazi resistance movement, the White Rose. From the end of June until mid-July 1942, they wrote the first four leaflets. Each leaflet was more critical of Hitler and the German people than the last. They encouraged citizens to resist the Nazi regime, denounce the murder of hundreds of thousands of Poles, and demand an end to the war. A passage written by Schmorell in the second leaflet, issued in June 1942, contains the only known public protest by any German resistance group, specifically against the Holocaust. We wish to cite the fact that since the conquest of Poland, 300,000 Jews have been murdered in that country in a bestial manner. Here, we see the most terrible crime committed against the dignity of man, a crime that has no counterpart in human history. No crime of this dimension has ever been perpetrated against human beings. The text blames the German people in their apathy for allowing such crimes to be committed by these criminal fascists. They appeal to what they considered the German intelligentsia, believing that these people would be easily convinced by the same arguments that also motivated them. These leaflets were left in telephone books and public phone booths, mailed to professors and students, and taken by courier to other universities for distribution. In the summer of 1942, male students at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich were required to deploy to the Eastern Front. Among them were Alexander Schmorell, as well as Hans Scholl and Willy Graf. From the 23rd of July, 1942, the young men served as medics in Russia where they saw with their own eyes how German soldiers treated prisoners and Jews in occupied territories. They observed the horrors of war and saw beatings and other mistreatment of Jews by the Germans. In a letter to his sister, Anneliese, Willi Graf wrote, I wish I had been spared the view of all this which I had to witness. Because Alexander Schmorell understood Russian, he could speak to the locals and translate everything they said to him to his friends from the White Rose. During this time, White Rose activities ceased and were not continued until the medics came home from the deployment. What the young men had experienced on the Eastern Front strengthened their determination to fight against Nazism. Sometime in the fall of 1942, Sophie Scholl, Hans's sister, learned about her brother's activities and immediately joined the movement. The last one to join was Kurt Huber, a university professor at Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, where the rest of the movement studied. During his teaching, he was known for teaching classes that did not push Nazi ideology, which made him a favorite with the university students. Huber joined the movement in December 1942. In January 1943, the fifth leaflet, Appeal to All Germans, was produced in 6,000 to 9,000 copies using a hand-operated duplicating machine. These leaflets, some simply folded, some placed in envelopes, were carried to other German cities by the members and supporters of the group and then mailed from there. Copies appeared in many cities, including Hamburg and Berlin. Schmorell himself distributed the leaflet in Austrian cities. He took the fast train from Munich to Salzburg at the end of January 1943, carrying several hundred letters. He arrived at the train station, passed through the ticketing area, headed for the city and posted the letters destined for Salzburg in two different mailboxes next to the train station. The same day, he caught the next train to Linz, where he mailed approximately the same number of leaflets under the same conditions. Still the same day, late in the evening, Schmorell took a fast train to Vienna so he could mail the remainder of the leaflets. He then rented a hotel room and the next day, he began mailing their letters in various mailboxes. This would have been around 100 to 200 letters. In Vienna, he also mailed around 50 to 100 leaflets, called to all Germans in letter format. These were destined for Frankfurt. This leaflet also mentioned, Germans, do you and your children want to suffer the same fate that befell the Jews? Are we to be forever a nation which is hated and rejected by all mankind? No, dissociate yourselves from national socialist gangsterism. Hitler says, I will fight to the last man, but in the meantime, the war has already been lost. It has become a mathematical certainty that Hitler is leading the German people into the abyss. Hitler cannot win the war, he can only prolong it. The guilt of Hitler and his minions goes beyond all measure. Retribution comes closer and closer. Soon after, on the 2nd of February, 1943, after months of fierce fighting and heavy casualties, the surviving German forces, only about 91,000 soldiers, surrendered Stalingrad on the Volga. 
The Battle of Stalingrad ended with a capitulation and near total loss of the Wehrmacht's 6th Army. While Hans Scholl was very depressed about the events in Stalingrad, Alexander Schmorell, as someone who cared about Russia, was downright happy about the newly created strategic situation for the Russians. On the 3rd, 8th, and 15th of February, Alexander Schmorell, Hans Scholl, and Willy Graf graffitied public buildings with slogans such as Hitler, the mass murderer, Down with Hitler, and Freedom on the walls of the university and other buildings in Munich. But the hopes of the White Rose members that the defeated Stalingrad would incite German opposition against the Nazi regime and the war effort did not come true. On the contrary, Nazi propaganda used the defeat to call on the German people to embrace total war. The group also produced their sixth pamphlet, which was to be their last. On the 18th of February, 1943, while Hans and Sophie were distributing leaflets at Ludwig Maximilian University, Sophie flung the last remaining leaflets from the top floor down the atrium. However, she was seen by Jakob Schmidt, the university maintenance man, and a vowed Nazi, who reported it to the official secret police of Nazi Germany, the Gestapo. Hans and Sophie were arrested. Christoph Probst was arrested two days after the Scholl siblings, when he went to pick up his paycheck before traveling to see his wife Hertha and his newly born daughter Katja. Along with Christoph Probst, the two siblings were tried for treason before the Nazi People's Court, which was infamous for its unfair political trials. The head judge of the court, Roland Freisler, was known as the Hanging Judge, as about 90% of his trials ended in death sentences. Judge Roland Freisler told the court, the accused have by means of leaflets in a time of war called for the sabotage of the war effort and armaments and for the overthrow of the national socialist way of life of our people, have propagated defeatist ideas and have most vulgarly defamed the Fuhrer, thereby giving aid to the enemy of the Reich and weakening the armed security of the nation. On this account, they are to be punished by death. Their honor and rights as citizens are forfeited for all time. On the 22nd of February, 1943, after a half-day trial, they were found guilty of treason and sentenced to death. Shortly after, they were brought to Munich Stadelheim prison, where they learned that they would be executed the same day. Even though they were originally scheduled to be executed by public hanging, there were fears that they would be raised to martyrdom status if they were publicly killed. So it was decided to kill them by guillotine in the execution chamber. While Sophie and Christoph were silent as they died, Hans yelled, long live freedom. Unfortunately, they were not the last to die. Although the three took all blame for the White Rose actions, their attempts to save their friends from persecution failed. After the arrest of Christoph Probst and the Scholl siblings, with the support of various acquaintances and with a forged passport, Schmorell tried to flee to Switzerland. However, fierce weather forced him back, and he returned to Munich on the 24th of February, 1943 the day his executed friends from the White Rose were buried. When at around 10 p.m., the air raid alarm sounded and Schmorell attempted to enter the air raid shelter, he was recognized, denounced, and arrested. He had previously been placed under public manhunt and a reward of 1,000 Reichsmarks was offered for his capture. Willy Graf had already been arrested on the 18th of February, 1943, and Kurt Huber was taken into custody on the 26th of February. During the time between his capture and his trial, Schmorell was interrogated multiple times. He also said, I cannot identify myself as a national socialist because I am more interested in Russia. I readily acknowledge my love for Russia. In contrast, I reject Bolshevism. My mother was Russian, I was born there, and I cannot help but care about this country. During my service on the Eastern Front, in the summer of 1942, I was never put into a situation where my attitude toward Russia could have possibly been detrimental to Germany's interests. If, as a soldier, I had had to take up arms against the Bolshevists before carrying out such an order, I would have had to advise my military CO that I could not do so. In my position as a medical officer, I was spared such an order. When I occasionally heard this and that through German propaganda about Russian subhumans, I was never convinced by it. On the 19th of April, 1943, Freisler was flown back again to stand as a judge over the second trial of the White Rose members, including Alexander Schmorell. Freisler yelled at the accused right at the opening, saying, National Socialism does not need a criminal code against such traitors as you are. I will make this process with you short. When an assessor handed him the penal code, 
Without a word, Frisley immediately threw it in the direction of the dock, where the accused had to duck to avoid being hit in the head. Schmorell admitted his anti-Nazi beliefs, also in front of Freisler, who hysterically screamed at him, calling him a traitor. Out of the 13 defendants, one was unexpectedly acquitted, nine were given prison sentences, and three, Schmorell, Graf and Huber, were sentenced to death. Unlike the first trial, where the death sentences had been carried out on the same day as the verdict, Alexander's execution was delayed, as his family petitioned for clemency. During this time, Alexander Schmorell wrote his father and stepmother from prison. There is one thing, however, that I want to tell you, so that your pain may be a little bit easier to bear. Should a pardon be rejected, please believe that death does not mean the end of every life, but in fact the opposite, birth, a transition to a new life, one which is wonderful and will last forever. Death is really nothing terrible. The separation is quite hard, but it will be less so if you think of it this way, that we won't be separated forever, but just for a time, like a trip, in order for us to meet again forever, and in all eternity, in a life that is infinitely more beautiful than the present one, and that there will be no end to us being together. Believe this, and then the burden will undoubtedly become easier for you. After about two months of deliberation, a letter came to prison that said, I reject all petitions for mercy. It was signed by Adolf Hitler. On the 13th of July, 1943, Alexander Schmorell and Kurt Huber were alerted that their execution would happen later that day. Schmorell was deeply inspired by his Orthodox Christian faith and was willing to sacrifice himself as a testimony to his faith in God that had taught him to love beauty and freedom, both of which the Nazis sought to destroy. After receiving communion from an Orthodox priest, Schmorell was allowed to write his last letter to his parents, in which he wrote, I am going with the awareness that I followed my deepest convictions and truth. This allows me to meet my hour of death with a conscience at peace. Think of the millions of young men who have lost their lives out on the field. Their fate is the same as mine. In a few hours, I will be in a better life with my mother, and I will not forget you. I will ask God to grant you solace and peace. Yours, Shurik. The guards came for Alexander a little after 5 p.m. He was led out of his cell and into the courtyard. Walking to his death with his head held high, he said to his lawyer, I am convinced that my life has to end now, early as it may seem, for I have fulfilled my life's mission. I wouldn't know what else I have to do on this earth. In the execution chamber, the state attorney asked if his name was Alexander Schmorell, to which he replied, yes. Then the blade fell, and Alexander Schmorell died. He was 25 years old. After the first White Rose trial, a copy of the sixth leaflet had been smuggled out of Germany to England. In July 1943, the same month when Alexander Schmorell was executed, the Royal Air Force dropped millions of propaganda copies all over Germany. This leaflet was retitled The Manifesto of the Students of Munich. Alexander's bravery is honored in Germany to this day. He and other members of the White Rose personify the importance of acting in accordance with one's beliefs even in the face of the greatest sacrifice of their own lives. Their actions made them enduring symbols of the struggle for the freedom of the human spirit. Completing the act of canonization, Schmorell was glorified as a saint and passion bearer by the Russian Orthodox Church, outside Russia in Munich on the 5th of February, 2012. Today, schools, squares and roads all bear the name of Alexander and the other members of the White Rose Movement, and it will forever remain a testament to their bravery. There were many tears shed for Alexander Schmorell. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you, and we'll see you next time on the channel.